My name is Nigel. I'm a product manager at Sendit. Sendit's an Indonesian headquartered but Southeast Asian uh, focused payments fintech company. Um, I'm Singaporean. I'm based in Singapore. What I do is that I'm a product manager in Sendit focused around our cards acceptance product. So I've been here for about three years. Uh, and to be perfectly honest, everybody else on this panel knows way more about UX and design uh, than myself. So I'm really just here to facilitate the conversation between them and let you guys hear from their learnings and their insights as well. So I'll now let the panelists take a bit of time to introduce each of them. Uh, maybe we can start with Shahina. Hi everyone, hope everyone's having a nice day. I enjoyed the talk Gaurav gave. Uh, also, I work in Microsoft. I lead uh, design and research for emerging markets where we are solving for the unmet and unarticulated needs of uh, the next billion users, as we say, as specifically focusing on countries like China, Brazil, Vietnam, Philippines, and India itself. India itself has um, a, a very different demographic, cultural diversity, and that makes it more complex to solve for um, uh, these people. Yeah, so that's that's what my work entails. It's uh, it's very very happening, and I completely enjoy that. Awesome, thank you so much. Next up, can we have uh, Preeti? So let's just go to the ladies first. Okay, all right. Thank you, Nigel. I'm excited to join this panel. Hi, everyone. I'm Preeti, and I head up uh, the new product design team at Visa, where we build regional new products around commerce and pay payment flows. And as most of you may not be aware, uh, Visa is not a credit card company, as you might first think when you hear the name Visa. We're a payments and commerce company and we work in a B2B2C space. So often we're looking to build optimal payment experiences, but with clients and partners. So we deal with a pretty matrix and complex landscape when it comes to design buying. Great, thank you, Preeti. And wow, today I learned that Visa is not a credit card company. Uh, lastly, uh, Jasper. Please introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. My name is Jasper. Uh, I'm a chief experience officer based in, uh, in Unix. So we are the company based in Tokyo, Japan. And yeah, so basically we are the third largest like OTT platform uh, in Japan's market. Uh, we have the video streaming book service and music service. Really great to meet everyone here today and looking forward to for you to listen to your question and help us who can answer your question. Nice to meet Great. you. Thanks, Thanks Jasper. Uh, for those of you on the call who may not know, uh, actually Preeti and Jasper have both had some individual sessions in UX CX as well around uh, topics such as design in an enterprise as well as creating a CX culture through sprints. So for those of you who are interested, uh, if you have access to the conference, you should be able to access those talks as well. So let's get our questions rolling. The first thing that we really want to ask our panelists today is a sort of cheeky open-ended question, which is, you know, in you guys' experience, what are the biggest myths you've come across, uh, myths, M-Y-T-H-S, about getting buy-in for design, UX, and CX? So maybe we can start with Shahina for this as well. Why it's me first, always. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> Next time it's someone else. Yes, definitely. Uh, so one of the biggest myths that I have heard that you always, always need uh, hard data to prove uh, that um, you know you need to go ahead with a design or not. So that's one of the biggest myths for me because I think there are many more methods and uh, frameworks and uh, ways that a designer or a product person can use to sort of uh, get by, you know, uh, start with uh, prototyping or, or but, but the biggest myth is that data is the only thing that can lead, lead you to sort of open uh, gateways for innovation or open gateways for building products. So what happens, Shahina, if, you know, you come to either a, a colleague or a, a upper management stakeholder and you're trying to propose something regarding design and they say, okay, um, show me the data. What justifies, what data justifies um, us going ahead with this, committing resource to this, resources to this? Sure. See, um, as a designer, right, uh, one of the quotes uh, I always, always use is that uh, by, uh, by Kate, who's from uh, Google Ventures, is that she says that if you go in a meeting and have a very narrow-minded approach and say, design, 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 you are very likely to not be taken seriously, one, uh, with the fact that it shows the apathy that you have towards the rest of the uh, uh, people that are sitting in the room, right? So it shows a very unilateral approach first. The other is, what is the design that you are proposing? Is it just aesthetic? 
or is it actually solving a customer problem? If it is solving a customer problem, you might not necessarily have the hard data that, look, if we do this, it'll go from X, X to Y or Y to Z, et cetera. But you definitely can show anecdotal evidences. You can show previous market research that have happened. Um, there is, uh, you know, you can show analysis. There are multiple frameworks you can show. One of the best that I use and it's just super simple is called the pyramid um, uh, pyramid principle, which focuses on what uh, what is the problem we are trying to solve and why is this actually a take our designs into these three uh, um, sort of bar Okay, it's, it becomes easier for rest of the people to understand. I remember that design, uh, selling your design or getting a buy-in is very, it's got, it's got very little to do with design and got a lot to do with how you sell that or how you how you portray that as a customer problem versus your own aspiration, right? And that's where you need to draw the line. You don't need to be married to the design and say, I need get to get this public. You need to speak from the customer's perspective that this will benefit the customer and this will uh, probably you know increase our NPS. For example, right, NPS has got nothing to do with revenue, but every time designers get stuck with that, this is revenue, this is revenue. I think there are multiple met uh, metrics that you can track. One is just happiness of the customer. One is just delight as well. It's not measurable, but how do you talk about it? And that's where you need to develop a, a business acumen and a, a more market understanding and maybe a, a little bit of a storytelling skills as well. Because if that you're not able to sell it, then then you're dead on arrival. That makes so much sense. We basically reframing it to just not just use the word design only, but to come at it with all the other interests that stakeholders might have. Thanks so much. Maybe you can jump to Jasper. So Jasper, the question was, what what are some of the biggest myths when it comes to getting buy-in for design, CX, and UX? Any thoughts on that? No. And thank you for mentioning about the storytelling. I totally agree. The storytelling is super important part when you try to um, bring up any discussion with the, any with the stakeholders. And for me, I think the myth is about, I always think about get a buy-in, it's just not like event, like just get it doing one time or two times. It's a long-term process. So it's, it's not about the events, it's more like a consistency about talking and discussion and communicating with stakeholders. So the most important thing for me is not just like, either you have the wonderful design, however, it's not only for the first time, but you need to continuously, repeatedly to gathering and working on something you are working on. So I think be passionate, it's very important for what you are working on. If you are the, the change maker inside the organization, definitely it takes some time. So be patient, I think it's a m m very important things, I think. Yeah, it definitely sounds, and I, and I got that sentiment from watching your, your session around creating that CX culture as well. Uh, Preeti, any, any thoughts around any other myths besides the, the, the overall bigger myth, which is that you don't always need data to get buy-in for design? Well, I think maybe one of the myths in a large enterprise is that you can only impact design change top-down, uh, <laughs> and that's not true. A lot of design change can be impacted by designers bottom-up. So I think if you can find ways to work collaboratively in sprints and to Jasper's point, that's really important. Don't look for change as a single event, uh, look for change. Setting near-term objectives for this change, what change do you want to impact with your stakeholders? Look at a three month window, you know, look at your environment and understand what kind of change you want to impact. So we look at things like, for instance, we want to make our prioritization better, or we want to engage clients upstream early on for validation. And these are small changes when you impact step by step can really ladder up and create that kind of advocacy you need, create the tribe you need, and create the support you need to move them up very right? quickly. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Preeti. Yeah, um, I think related to that, we've got a question from one of our audience members from Ludwig, who's asking, you know, if customer happiness doesn't lead to measurable business results, why is it important? Is this question for me? It can be for anybody. I think all, all of you guys sort of address that in a bit as well. Well, customer happiness, I think when we look at how would we quantify customer happiness, customer happiness, you can quantify via retention, right? So I think in my opinion, mm -hmm. I think there is a direct business connect, you know? So when we look at the growth and the scaling of any product, that's an inst like direct correlation to customer happiness and, and product success and then the business metrics attached to that. So I would say measuring customer happiness, there are definitely business metrics. You might not correlate them necessarily because you're looking at maybe 
revenue numbers and you're looking at business KPIs, but there's a way to translate that back into customer success metrics. Yes. Right. And to be, to be honest, you know, if, if your customers are being happy, but you're not actually translating that into tangible business outcomes, that may yeah. not be a problem with design. It may be a problem with the business model yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, Shahina, any thoughts on that? Yeah, definitely. I think today, uh, you know, uh, it's been 25 years that, uh, you know, companies have been building tech products and they're traditionally moving from just building shipping. Now they've realized the importance of design because design is not just what it looks like. It's actually adding to their competitive advantage. If you look at some of the best companies that have been very, very successful, the competitive advantage that they have is design, the quality of the product, the communication that they are, how they are reaching out to the people, right? For example, Nike, nobody needs to even talk about Nike. Why are they the, one of the most successful people in the shoe business? Because they're not selling shoe, they're selling something else. And similarly, design, when it becomes a competitive advantage, you cannot ignore it anymore. Coming to customer happiness, right? Like Preeti very rightly mentioned, if the customer is not happy, he will simply leave the platform. He will simply leave your product. And if you see that happening over a period of time, then you realize they're not happy, but you don't need to wait for that, right? There are multiple frameworks that you actually use to measure that retention. The one of the um, uh, things that we at Microsoft actually do is being co constantly customer obsessed. You know, reaching out to our customer, we we constantly keep connecting to them on a monthly basis. We have customers that we go back to and constantly take feedback. Hey, is this working with you? Not working with you? Because a certain a pool of customers will actually give you a, a sense of what, whether your product is actually helping them, whether they are happy with the product or not, right? And these are the things that can actually impact. Why do you think today companies like Amazon, Microsoft, Google, they're actually talking about this very common phrase of customer obsession. There's a science behind it because it actually impacts the numbers, not directly, indirectly, but if given a good enough time frame, you will definitely see the impact. So rather than waiting to see those numbers crumble or increase, you sort of sustainability work towards it in a pattern that's healthy and looking at the long term because customer happiness is not something that's one month month to month it's a life goal for the company till the time the company exists and if customers are happy that's the only reason why a company would exist unless it's a monopoly of a government then it's a different thing but if you're in a competition then that's the only thing that um, uh, sort of separates you from rest of the competition thanks so much Shahina. and while we're on you um our audience member also asked what were the three parts of the pyramid pyramid model again the one you mentioned yeah very oh so the first part is the what you know, if you're going in any meeting, uh, break it down into simple, uh, similar to design thinking. What is the problem that you're approaching your stakeholders with, right? Write down a bit about it. And how is that even a problem today? So for example, one of the things that we do is um, uh, we, we say pick up, if we're we are trying to build a prototype in a particular segment, we say, this is what we think is the problem. Why we think is because this is how the people are trying to solve it and they're actually frustrated. So you might wanna build two, three videos of people frustrated and here, this is how we're trying to build it. And this is, we, we've tested it out and this is what they're happy with. So this yeah. sort of sets you up for success on day one and opens up the conversation you know, you, you break the ice immediately saying you've done your homework and you've come, you've not come with a unilateral design that, hey, this is what I've designed. And I think based on my intuition, we should go forward with it. Got it. Awesome. Hope that answers our viewers' questions. So just this segues nicely into our next question. You know, we've been talking about how we can, or rather the myths around, which is that you don't actually always need data to get management buy-in for design, CX and UX, right? And so we, we want to ask our panelists, you know, what are some hacks or tips or tricks that you use personally and you found to be effective to getting the buy-in for resources to be allocated for design, for your proposals or your, your requests to be approved, especially when you don't have the data. So Jasper, I want to start with you because your, <laughs> your, sure. your session, uh, I really like the quote you mentioned by Tom Chi, which is, you know, nobody changes their behavior for a neutral outcome, which makes a yep. lot of sense. So the question yep. would be, you know, how do you prove that you can get a positive and not a neutral outcome without the data? And what are some tips or tricks that you bring into your stakeholders to tell them, hey, you know, um, and, and to try and get buy-in from them? Yeah, I think uh, this is uh, like, uh, I think everyone maybe know there's a kind of framework it called portal persona or ad hoc persona. So basically a lot of time when we, 
when we start for the new project, and every, I believe every stakeholder is thinking about different target. Marketing guy think about the target like that. Product people think about a target like that. Uh, mm-hmm. Strategy people think about they, they are focused on someone. So everyone is thinking about different person, different audience, different target. So at this moment, I will try to facilitate some workshop like uh, ad hoc persona, proto persona. So I want to make sure everyone is thinking about the same thing and get a consensus inside a meeting. I think uh, I think it's super helpful for the people who have who don't have the data. We just need to bring every stakeholders, their brand and using their mind, what they are thinking and discussion and ideation together. I think most of the time is the organization don't have a chance to bring everyone together to have the open mind discussion. So I think if you don't have the data or you are in a very small startup, I think it's you can using the tr- like the, the, the framework like Porto Persona is really helpful for you to understand your customer first. Awesome, yeah. that's right. And, and to briefly, you know, in your session, I, th- I think I saw a whole range of tools being described from immersion sessions to pull ideations to the designers yeah. you know, speaking business to feedback loops. If you were to yeah. choose, you know, your, your tried and tested surefire way of, you know, in, yeah. in your experience, most effective method out of all of these things that you implemented at Visa, what would you say that is to, to getting management buy-in, especially without data? I think the three things that have worked for us really well, maybe I'll talk about the top three, is really demystifying design for a lot of non-design stakeholders. So the way we approach it, we always think about how to tell a business story with design as your hero. So how would you pitch it if you had to think about it that way? So that's really useful, especially in the immersion sessions that we set up, right? Because they come in because they're interested in the product for the business. And design is really an instrument within that. And that's how we approach these immersion sessions. And that's been really effective for us in terms of being able to engage a wide array of stakeholders. Um, And generally, we always assess to try and lose the jargon as much as possible, try and, you know, make the frameworks invisible as much as possible. So we're talking about the content then. I think the second thing that's been really effective for us is feedback loops, because we have systematic feedback loops that we put in place as part of our product design process. So we do feedback loops with all our stakeholders every quarter, for instance. Uh, we do this through qual. We also do a survey. Uh, and, and so that's been really effective in helping us understand how to get better at this, engaging our stakeholders for buying. But we also do a lot of instant feedback. So we'll typically encourage team members to reach out to your key product stakeholders, right? So if it's someone in tech or risk or legal, whoever that might be, reach out to them, have a conversation. So even if it's five or 10 minutes, cultivate that relationship and that get that dialogue going. That's, that's also been super helpful. And generally, you know, this might be a bit controversial for designers is we, what we, the way we approach this is not being very precious maybe about our design methods. So we have a particular way. So if you look at you know, how design thinking as a methodology works. So any kind of design process works, the customer sits at the center and your instinct and would be always to say, let's focus on solving for that customer problem first and come back to the technical solution. But often when you work in a large enterprise, you might hit a wall with, you know, that kind of approach. Sometimes what we do is actually solve for the technical obstacles that might be bigger first. We know that we're going to get to the customer experience, but we're flexible about that. So this just thinking on your feet in terms of how you're flexing your design process to work around an organization that may have some non-negotiables, I think that's also been very effective. So it's not taking it off the table. It's just knowing how to you know, approach it uh, in a way that's non-linear and flexible. I think these are the three things that we've seen have been very good for us and have been uh, by that's very strategic. It's almost as if um, looking for the path of least resistance. Yeah, but not cut off. Be it from business, be it from technical, or, or any of the teams, and identifying what would be the biggest obstacle. As you mentioned, if it's the technical team that needs help first, then designers actually breaking past the, the wall of thinking, okay, I'm just going to think about design or business, by actually approaching the technical team and saying, hey, hey guys, you know what can we as designers do? to work together with the tech team to pass the, that obstacle and then leaving the rest to, to work itself out. Yeah. And I must say yeah. that as a product manager, you know, um, all of the things that you're, you're, you're talking about regarding how design interacts with product is very relevant to me as well. I see it and send it all the time. When I look at my design team, I don't just see them as, oh, okay, so it's a bunch of designers who I just farm off design requests to, but especially mm-hmm. just like thought, thought, thought product leaders, you know, when you read about books like Empowered or Inspired, they, they see designers as, integral and essential as part of the product design process, such that mm-hmm. he even rec- uh, the author even recommends 
the PM and the designer sitting together at the same desk regularly, right? And so yeah. we want to bring this conversation to Shahina as well, related to you know tips and tricks or your, your surefire methods to getting buy-in. And it's actually a nice to tie in a, a question from one of our audience members who's who's directing this to Shahina around you know the pyramid model. And, and she's asking, how do you begin the research and design in the first place to convince your stakeholders that this is a viable issue to look at and solutions are being built? So this is actually a good, uh, you, your answer can even tackle both my question and her question at the same time. Sure. Uh, I think one um, trick that's always worked, and firstly, you have to understand who you're going to talk to, who is, who are those people, or who is that person, who is the key decision maker, and what is his or her OKR? What is driving that person? The moment you understand that, it's about speaking that person's language, because otherwise, it's just uh, you know, a foreign language to that person. No, even if you do a monkey dance, it doesn't work. So you have to be very practical in terms of who is that person and what is his motivation to say a yes to what you're proposing, right? And uh, the other is the return on investment. If you're asking him to invest his money or invest his time into this, then what is, what's in it for him and what's in it for the organization. Now here I'm saying very categorically that to understand the people you want to influence, because sometimes it's easier to influence people who have an understanding of design, how design impact. And sometimes it's, it's, not, that, it's not the case. Sometimes you're talking to the finance officer and how do you sort of convince him that this is it, right? Because there are multiple stakeholders that designers have to sort of go, go by. Now, return on investment talks specifically about the revenue. For example, in my one of my previous organizations where we had to uh, build a design system. Now, building a design system is a long activity. It is an activity that requires multiple people's contribution, multiple people's time. Now, the organize the time is currency in any organization right um especially in an engineering first organization so if you can say that you know 10 engineers wasting 50 hours of the week on replicating the same uh, uh, same assets that they could have ideally used from design system it would have saved them x amount of time and that x amount of time is actually so many dollars or rupees per month now Cumulated with 10, 10 engineers wasting the time in this, it means like some lakhs of rupees or some, you know, uh, whatever dollars, right? Once you start calculating this cycle of return on investment, it becomes easier to convince because then you're speaking their language. They're like, oh, this is our language. This seems familiar. You know, that's, whether we like it or not, humans have biases, right? We cannot eliminate them completely. One of the biases is the familiarity bias. If someone comes and tells us, hey, I worked on Sketch and Figma, I, our eyes will lit up. But if they say, I was doing something is in in excel or something in like uh some other tally tool it, it won't excite us so what excites them money revenue profits that's absolutely okay talk in their language build that business acumen and just make it very simple what how and uh, you know why Th these three things the moment you put these three in buckets and propose it to them as numbers it becomes easier to move people and negotiating with non-designers very important because sometimes the pe person you directly want to influence actually gets influenced by three four other people on the site and you might want to first influence those people yep. right like a cto will actually get probably influenced by a principal tech lead or a senior uh, engineering manager so try and build that rapport see we need to be very realistic and practical that we are the new kids on the block. We've just arrived. And just because we've arrived doesn't mean the engineers who've been working for 20, 30 years in this product field, they're going to listen to us. So you have to come to a common ground. You have to bridge that gap and you have to be proactive in learning their language. Right. Um, so, yeah, yeah. That and you communicate the trade-offs and risks and benefits, right? The uh, the trade-offs, like if we do this, then this is the benefit. If we don't do this, then this is the cost. And hey, I am giving you all the options. Now you decide whether you want to take the loss or the profit. I'm, I'm being very crude here, but that's sometimes the reality. No, yeah, I mean, you know, whatever works, right? To, to get what we want to achieve for in, for in terms of, you know, success outcomes for the company. And I think, your, what you've raised, Shahina, around speaking the language of the people who are trying to convince 
is extremely relevant to what we want to talk about next, which will be the final topic that we're addressing on this panel, which is, you know, how, how let's say we've already gotten that buy-in, how do we then facilitate change management to adapt to the initiatives or the proposals that you've already gotten buy-in for and help or rather cause the rest of the people in your organization to also give you that buy-in. You know, let's say you've got management buy-in, now you need to convince the rest of the people in your organization to follow the proposal, right? And on this, I want to start with Jasper because Jasper, in your previous session, you talked about the Japanese concept of nemawashi, which is, you know, uh, yeah. preparing the roots of a plant before the plant grows, right? And I think that's really interesting. So I was just wondering, you know, in, in, in the context of um, J Japanese culture and, and an organization yeah. in Japan, how would you get the rest of the organization to, uh, or, or rather, how would you facilitate change management to um, bring effect to what you've already gotten buy-in for? I think, yeah, thanks for mentioning that. I think uh, for in Japan's culture, I think especially people really care about the, sometimes people care about the organization relationship more than the product is good or bad. If this is very important part, most important because of, of the, the, in Japan's culture, people might work in, in one company for their lifetime long, like in their all entire life, they work in the same company to maintain a good relationship is very important for them. So for me, I think how to convince and get a buy-in, I think the first is try to do the, as much a communication you have. And I think that's very important. And it's just understanding and listen from each stakeholders. And second things I think is show the proof. I think show the proof is very important, like accumulate some small success and then show them step by step. Like as what I say, take times, not like overnight things. So working on small project, working on small success with the team you can work with and you convince already, and then getting uh, bigger and bigger to the people surrounding by you. And I think this is step I, or the approach I would like to take for maybe in different type of culture can try this way too. And on that note, on different points of culture, I think Preeti, in Visa, you work on an APEC scale, mm -hmm. like a regional scale. So how yeah. have you, how have you, you know, ancestrated not only in an enterprise, but a regional company, um, yeah. talk about change management for some of your design initiatives. So I think one of the things that we learned early on is to engage a team sitting in our markets, especially when we're working on products. If you're working on a product and we have, let's say, India and Australia's priority markets, we engage them from day one. I think that's made the massive uh, difference to uh, how we've been able to get that acceptance for that initiative and adoption for it uh, right from the get-go. So what we would typically do is speak to our product leads in the market, ask them for folks that we think are relevant for this. We do a we take a squad approach, so get into a huddle. We usually will pitch this to them, get their input, set up joint success calls. So that initiative is not just a design initiative. We're talking about a product and a business initiative the market has a stake in now. But we, uh, to Jasper's point, along the way, because if you think of the halo effect you want to have, I might be speaking to maybe 15 people who are actively engaged, but you have 1,500 people or 15,000 people to reach. We definitely do a lot of structured communication and reporting. Uh, that's, you know, we have bi-weekly to certain groups. We have monthly to other groups, quarterly to, you know, a third group. Uh, but uh, that's been helpful and we regularly host what we call product demo days. So we do a lot of show and tell, we show progress, we demo, we get feedback and we do this with multiple circles. So it's not an easy thing to do. I think everyone needs to understand that this is an enormous amount of time, effort, constantly thinking on your feet, you know, understanding, responding to the situation and, and, uh, being able to orchestrate, you know, I think that street smart uh, skills, but along with systemic skills is very important to be able to uh, drive that kind and facilitate that kind of change management. But for us, I think we typically adopt, you know, at all three levels, frequent communication, frequent reporting, frequent show and tell, uh, and then just keep that running in, in, you know, in an ongoing loop that's been helpful. Thanks so much, Preeti. And, and finally, to end off, you know, we, we, we'd love to keep the conversation going, but it's the end of our session. So we will just like to ask Shahina to talk about her experience facilitating change management in Microsoft, but focused on a country as large, as diverse, you know, and with those cultural uh, 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 phenomenons in India. So Shahina, go ahead. Yeah. 
I think the mantra of the team is that uh, change is the only constant and change is the name of game for us. So uh, people working in my team, especially emerging markets, right? There's so much of uncertainty, ambiguity all the time. Uh, but embracing ambiguity is one of the, I think, resilient uh, aspect a designer must have. And not getting married to anything that they're building because that's that's going to be the uh, sort of uh, one of the biggest aspects that will determine your growth. If you're married to uh, design a product that you're building, then you will get obsessed with it. You wouldn't want to grow. Your growth mindset will sort of get start, start slashing off. So um, uh, again, if if any individual is getting a buy-in. That you should be immediately detached from the buy-in from that day. Then it's you don't own it. The 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 way it should play is that you should make your team own it. The everybody should own it. And the moment everybody feels that they own it, right? Like Preeti mentioned, beautiful things like show and tell, frequent communication, structured communication. And that feeling should be because it's a new project, because you have proposed it. So people should not be feeling that because she has proposed it, she's trying to make us work and take the credit. Etc. See, again, human psychology plays a very, very important role here. You have to make people own it. You have to, whether it's third party customers, you have to learn to build with them, right? Make sure that they feel that they are owning part of it, that they are the decision makers. And you have to take a back seat. Because eventually, no matter how much you are invested in it, if others don't feel invested, they won't work towards making it as successful as you want to. So relationship building should be your core priority from day one. Thank you so much, Shahina. You know, we've covered so many themes today, communications, relationships, getting buy-in beyond data. And we just want to, again, thank our amazing panelists, Shahina, Jasper, and Preeti, for their time and effort coming down to share their experiences with all of you. We see that there are many questions left for the panelists in our UXDX uh, uh, platform. Uh, we will ask the panelists to get to those when they have time and when they can see the questions. But for now, we've got to end today's session. So if you guys have any more questions, I think you can find each of our panelists' profiles on LinkedIn, linked on the UXDX website. You can reach out to them there. And uh, we hope everyone is staying safe and have a great rest of the day as well as a great rest of the UXDX conference.